I always wanted to be a writer, ever since I was a little kid. When I first started writing um, kind of crappy little fan fiction in my uh, school notebooks instead of paying attention in class. And uh, I, I knew that, that what I really wanted to do with my life was be a novelist. But breaking into the publishing industry is practically impossible. I mean, it is, it is functionally impossible, especially when it's the 1980s or so, and, and you have to get a literary agent, you have to get a publisher. It's, um, it's just not something that's easy to do, and very few people manage to crack their way in. Um, so when the time came for me to choose a college major, I, I really wanted to go into creative writing. I really wanted to be a, a writer. I wanted to write narrative fiction. But I also wanted to eat regular meals <laughs> and sleep somewhere other than a park bench. So I decided I would go into computer programming, which I really like. So I did that. I went to school for four years to be a computer programmer, and then I uh, dropped out because I ran out of money, because that's what my generation does. <laughs> and I, I uh, got jobs as a software engineer. It was pretty easy back then. It was the 90s. You could just stumble into a building, and if you could stand on two feet, they'd figure, OK, we can train them to do the rest. So I was a computer programmer for many years. And then uh, now we're going forward in time a little bit to 1999. I'm an, I'm an engineer for America Online, which was at that time the number one internet service provider in the world. <laughs> and uh, I, got, uh, I got laid off along with 800 of my closest friends when they merged with Netscape, which gives you another little time reference there. <laughs> and um, I, I got a really good severance package. And I thought to myself, oh, well, how good is this severance package? I got like six months pay, and oh, apparently I have some AOL stock options. I should look at this. And turns out that I had a huge amount of money in stock options that I wasn't paying attention to, because engineers don't pay attention to things that aren't engineering. And um, uh, I was forced to sell them at the absolute all-time high that AOL ever had. <laughs> because of, I'd been laid off and I only had 60 days to sell. So I assure you I would not have made a wise financial decision left to my own devices, but I was forced to. <laughs> so I had a bunch of money, and I'm like, I can go years on this. This is my shot. I'll take my chance. I'm going to become a full-time novelist. I've got years. I don't have to maintain a day job or anything. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a book, and I'm going to try to get it published. I'm going to try to crack into the industry. I know it's hard, but I'm going to give it a whirl. So I did just that. I wrote a book. And then I tried to get into the industry. I tried to get a literary agent. I tried to get publishers interested. And that book, by the way, was not The Martian. You haven't heard of that book. Because <laughs> I did not break into the industry. Uh, I, I experienced the same tale of woe that any, that any uh, writer wannabe tends to experience, which is that I, I just could not get any interest. I just uh, I couldn't, uh, couldn't get an agent, couldn't get a publisher. The nice agents, the nice literary agents, were the ones who uh, would send me rejections. So they, those were the guys that I really appreciated. Anyway, so after three years of not being able to break into the industry, I decided, all right, I gave it my shot. I don't need to wonder what might have been. I, I did actually try. It's, I, I tried to attain my dream, and it didn't work out, and that's OK. At least I tried. So then I went back into software engineering. And this wasn't a Charlie Brown hang his head, walk with sad music in the background situation. I like computer programming. I've always liked it. Ultimately, I did it for 25 years. So I went back into the software industry. And then right around this time, the internet started to come to be. And it became easy for any idiot to make a website. <laughs> and I th realized, oh, here's an opportunity where I can just be creative online and I can post my stuff online, and people can read it, and they can enjoy it or not, or whatever. It gives me an opportunity to have an audience for my hobby, and so I, I'm going to be a, a hobbyist. I'll never be a professional writer. That's just never going to happen, um, but it'll be a hobby. All right, so I started writing stuff. I started off with um, a web comic, and then I made another web comic. Then I started writing short stories, and I started making some serials. And all the time, I would just post them to my website, and um, I had a mailing list of a, that over 10 years, the mailing list grew to about 3,000 people. So when I tell people, oh, my mailing list was 3,000 people, they're like, wow, that's impressive. I'm like, not really. It took 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I would send them an email whenever I posted anything new. And I'd get reader feedback that way, and it felt good. So The Martian was just one of those things that I was dumping onto that site. I was actually working on three serials at the same time. There was The Martian, and then there was a story about aliens invading Earth, and then there was a story about a 19th century mermaid. 
sort of an eclectic match, and I would post whatever I felt like working on, or sometimes I'd just post a short story. But I'd get lots of feedback from my readers, and it was great. So, over three years, from 2009 to 2012, I managed to finish The Martian. I got them all posted, got all the chapters posted, and probably posted a chapter every six to eight weeks. And the reader feedback was overwhelmingly positive from The Martian, and also overwhelmingly nerdy, because <laughs> All, my readers are hardcore dorks like me, and I'll tell you, there's nothing dorks love more than correcting math errors. <laughs> <laughs> so I had 3,000 fact checkers when I was writing this book. It was nice. <laughs> and uh, eventually, I, oh, oh, and occasionally I would say like, oh, and here's a new chapter on this other story that I've been working on. And the readers would be like, yeah. So about The Martian, when are you posting more of that? So it, helped, it really helped motivate me. Eventually, I finished, and I thought, like, okay, I'm done. I finished the whole book. People can enjoy it. Now I'm going to work on one of my other serials or whatever. And I started to get email from people. People started to say, like, hey, Andy, I love, your, uh, I love The Martian. I really enjoy reading it, but I hate your website because it sucks. And it does. <laughs> my website was totally ghetto. It was just white background, blue links, left justified. And you, <laughs> and you click it, and you get text. And it's like, there, read that. And they're like... I hate reading your story on a web page. Can you make an e-reader version? So I can just put it on my e-reader and read it like a human would. And so <laughs> I said, like, OK. So I figured out how to do that, and I posted an e-reader version. And I'm like, there you go, everybody. And then I got other emails from people saying, like, hey, I love your story, hate your site, and I see it's cool. You have an e-reader version, but I'm not very technically savvy. And I don't know how to download a thing from the internet and put it on my e-reader. Can you post it to Amazon? so I can just get it through their system, because I know how to do that. So I figured out how that works. It's actually pretty simple. I used uh, Kindle Direct Publishing, KDP, and it's just a simple matter of you upload. I anyone can use it. There's no like verification or validation process. There's no editors. There's nothing. It's just straight up self-publishing. And you just upload your story to, to, their, to their servers. You upload your EPUB, and then they sit on it for like two days. Um, to, make a, to, to make sure that a human gets to look at it before it goes out, just to make sure you're not posting a bunch of goat porn or something. <laughs> and don't judge. <laughs> and then um, once, they've, once they've gotten a look at it, they, they post it and it becomes public and it shows up in their searches. However, you're not allowed to give it away. Amazon actually makes their money from, um, from ebook sales. When, when it comes to the ebook side of things, they make all their money from the ebook sales. They actually lose money on every Kindle they make. Because of that, they do not let you give things away. You're not allowed to give away ebook stuff. You have to set the price to an absolute minimum of 99 cents. So I set the price to 99 cents, which is the minimum, meaning I was personally pulling down a cool 30 cents a copy in royalties. <laughs> And I said, all right, folks, you can read it for free on my website, you can download it for free from my website, or you can pay Amazon a dollar to put it on your Kindle for you. And more people bought it than downloaded it for free. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> well, there's a few things. First off, Amazon has a tremendous reach into the readership market. Second off, people are willing to pay a buck to get around technical hurdles. And third off, uh, kind of a secondary minor thing was this, this snowballing that happened with the, with the sales in that my 3,000 readers had for many years periodically been emailing me saying, hey, how can I donate to your site? How do I donate to your site maintenance? A lot of, a lot of websites have a little PayPal donate button. You don't have that. And I'm like, I'm an engineer. I make a six-figure salary. I'm good. And, but, and I would really hate to take donations from people who, have, who make way less money than me, right? So I just said, I don't take donations. If you must donate to something, donate to cancer research or something that matters. <laughs> but now all these people suddenly had an avenue by which they sensed they could send me money. So they all bought a copy of the book, even though they'd read it. <laughs> and so that got it started with, with uh, really good sales right at the start. And, um, and it, word started to get around. And it, it got really good reviews on Amazon. People gave it you know, four and five stars. And then uh, it started showing up in the Amazon um, like you might also like list. So you go to some very popular book, and, and it says, well, you might also like The Martian. That helps sales. Then eventually, it, it really starts to snowball once you get into the top X lists. So top 10 sci-fi, top 10 Kindle, top whatever. Because you got somebody who's like, oh, I want to read a sci-fi book. I don't know what I want to read. What are the top 10? And so you end up with a whole bunch of sales. 
Anyway, it sold very, very well over the, following, over the next six months. And then, uh, unbeknownst to me, at this time, there is an editor named Julian Pavia at Random House, and someone had recommended the book to him. And they said, like, oh, this is a good self-published book. You might want to consider making a print edition. And so he looked at it, and he's like, I don't know if I want to read this. It looks kind of like a textbook. I don't, I don't know if this is what I want. And his colleague, a literary agent named David Fugate, said, like, well, I'll read it. I mean, you, if you seem to be interested in it, so I'll, I'll take a look. And Julian says, sure, go ahead. So David read it, and he liked it. And so he contacted me and said, hey, do you, do you need a literary agent? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so after three years of not being able to get an agent or a publisher or anything interesting, one's knocking on my door. And I, so I went online to check to make sure he's a real person, not a <laughs> Nigerian prince or anything. And then I'm like, sure, you're my agent. He's like, great, Julian, how much are you going to give us for this book? And so uh, they started working out the print deal. And so they were working on the deal for the print edition. Then we got contacted by Fox, 20th Century Fox, who wanted the film rights. That's interesting. And then, so uh, David farmed it off to a colleague of his who's a film rights agent. And pe people get a little too excited when they hear about movie options and film rights. Um, when a studio comes and, and acquires the film option, as it's called, for your book, it doesn't mean they're going to make a movie out of it. It just means they're buying the exclusive ability to buy the rights from you. So in other words, they give you a little bit amount of money, they give you a little bit of money so that they'll have 18 months during which they're the only people who are allowed to buy the rights from you. That's how it works. And you pre-negotiate that whole deal. So it's all worked out, start to finish, that whole deal. And, and, but the vast majority of options never get exercised. And there, in fact, are authors who just sit there and cycle options. They get the small amount of money, then it expires, then they sell it again to another studio, and that's fine. So everybody told me, don't get too excited about the movie, folks. It's, uh, it's less than 1% chance that they'd actually make the movie. <laughs> so um, both of these negotiations were going on at the same time. My literary agent was negotiating with Random House for the print edition. Um, my film agent was negotiating with 20th Century Fox for the, um, for the film uh, rights. And all this is going on. And meanwhile, by the way, I'm still a computer programmer. I'm in my cubicle, fixing bugs, then running off to take a call about my movie deal, then back to the cubicle. <laughs> it was a very surreal time. And those two deals, those two deals, the print deal and the movie deal, came together four days apart. That was an eventful week for me, and I had to take a day off to go lay down. <laughs> so... And at first, honestly, like, I kind of felt like these were all scams. Like, these were just voices on the phone and emails and things telling me, hey, uh, we just uh, were wondering if we could make all your dreams come true. Is that cool? <laughs> uh, I was just waiting for the part when they're like, ooh, we need a $10,000 check to clear this tax hurdle or something, you know? <laughs> but when I, when I signed the print deal and saw the address I was mailing the contract to, it was 1745 Broadway, New York, New York, I'm like, well, that's pretty convincing. And then once they sent me the checks, I was like, well, if they're scamming me, they're not very good at it. <laughs> anyway, so everything came together, and you guys mostly know the rest. The book got onto the New York Times bestseller list. The movie was made, uh, if you've heard. And the um, uh, movie did extremely well, and everybody made huge piles of money. So here's the question, like, wh why am I here telling you guys about this? Why am I here at a TED Talk talking about like my, my weird method by which I backed into the publishing world? Well, it is exactly about that, in that for the last 600 years or so, publishing has had a set economic model. You have to work your way into the industry. It's extremely difficult to break in. You need a lot of luck. You need, you, you need a lot of skill, for starters, and then you need a lot of luck on top of that. And then once you're in, you're in. It was almost like a nobility system. But that, in the past 10 years, out of, a, out of like 600 years of publishing, in the past 10 years, it has completely changed. It's no longer like that at all. There's no longer an old boy network between you and the reader. You can make something and post it. When I started, it was just the internet. But now there's even formalized structures, like Amazon, Barnes & Noble. They all have these systems by which you can post your book up there. And if people like it, they'll rate it highly. They'll recommend it to each other. It'll get around. So publishing has now turned into a pure meritocracy, which is something that 
back in 1983 when I was daydreaming about becoming a, an author was unthinkable and unimaginable. So that, that's, that's a way in which technology has completely changed this, uh, this entire industry. And I, I, for one, couldn't be happier because I wouldn't be here otherwise. <laughs> so I guess the point is <laughs> there, there is nothing preventing you from succeeding in publishing anymore at all. So anybody who wants to do it can. And if you write a story that's good enough, you will succeed. Thank you.